The Best City for Business, an excerpt from American Psycho by Brett Easton Ellis. The Best City for Business. And on a rainy Tuesday morning, after working out at Exclusive, I stopped by Paul Owen's apartment on the Upper East Side. 161 days have passed since I spent the night in it with the two escort girls. There has been no word of bodies discovered in any of the city's four newspapers or on the local news, no hints of even a rumor floating around. I've gone so far as to ask people, dates, business acquaintances, over dinners, in the halls of Pierce and Pierce, if anyone has heard about two mutilated prostitutes found in Paul Owen's apartment. But, like in some movie, no one has heard anything, has any idea of what I'm talking about. There are other things to worry over. The shocking amount of laxative and speed that the cocaine in Manhattan is now being cut with. Asia in the 1990s. The virtual impossibility of landing an 8 o'clock reservation at PR, the new Tony McManus restaurant on Liberty Island. Crack. So what I'm assuming is that, essentially, like, no bodies have been found. For all I know, Kimball has moved to London, too. The building looks different to me as I step out of the taxi, though I can't figure out why. I still have the keys I stole from Owen the night I killed him, and I take them out now to open the lobby door, but they don't work, won't fit properly. Instead, a uniformed doorman who wasn't here six months ago opens it for me, excusing himself for taking so long. I stand there in the rain, confused until he ushers me in, merrily asking with a thick Irish accent, Well, are you coming in or staying out? You're getting soaked. I move into the lobby, my umbrella held under one arm, tucking the surgical mask I brought with me to deal with the smell back into my pocket. I'm holding a Walkman, debating what to say, how to phrase it. Well. Now what can I do for you, sir? he asks. I stall, a long, awkward pause, before saying simply, 14A. He looks me over carefully before checking his book, then beams, marking something down. Ah, of course. Mrs. Wolf is up there right now. Mrs. Wolf? Weakly, I smile. Yes, she's the real estate agent, he says, looking up at me. You do have an appointment, don't you? The elevator operator, also a new addition, stares at the floor as the two of us rise up into the building. I'm trying to retrace my steps on that night, during that whole week, uselessly knowing I have never been back to this apartment after murdering the two girls. How much is Owen's apartment worth? is a question that keeps forcing its way into my mind until it finally just rests there, throbbing. The Patty Winter show this morning was about people with half their brains removed. My chest feels like ice. The elevator doors open. I step out cautiously, watching behind me as they close. Then I'm moving down the hallway toward Owen's apartment, I can hear voices inside. I lean against the wall, sighing, keys in my hand, knowing already the locks have been changed. As I wonder what I should do, trembling, staring at my loafers, which are black and by A. Testoni, the door to the apartment opens, startling me out of a momentary flash of self-pity. A middle-aged real estate broker walks out, offers a smile, asks, checking her book, Are you my eleven o'clock? No, I say. She says, Excuse me, and making her way down the hall, looks back at me once, 
with a strange expression on her face before disappearing around the corner. I'm staring into the apartment. A couple in their late twenties stand, conferring with each other in the middle of the living room. She's wearing a wool jacket, a silk blouse, wool flannel slacks, Armani, vermeil earrings, gloves, holding a bottle of Evian water. He has on a tweed sport jacket, cashmere sweater vest, cotton chambray shirt, tie, Paul Stewart, Agnes B. cotton trench coat draped over arm. Behind them, the apartment looks spotless. New Venetian blinds, the cowhide paneling is gone. However, the furniture, the mural, the glass coffee table, thonnet chairs, black leather couch all seem intact. The large screen television set has been moved into the living room and it's been turned on, the volume low, a commercial where a stain walks off a jacket and addresses the camera is on now. But it doesn't make me forget what I did to Christie's breasts, to one of the girl's heads, the nose missing, both ears bitten off, how you could see her teeth through where I had ripped the flesh from her jaws and both cheeks, the torrents of gore and the blood that washed over the apartment, the stench of the dead, my own confused warning that I had drawn in, can I help you? The real estate agent, Mrs. Wolf, I'm guessing, intrudes. She has a very angular, thin face. The nose is large, distressingly real-looking heavily lipsticked mouth, white blue eyes. She's wearing a wool boucle jacket, washed silk blouse, shoes, earrings, a bracelet from where I don't know. Maybe she's younger than 40. I'm still leaning against the wall, staring at the couple who move back into the bedroom, leaving the main room empty. I'm just noticing that bouquets in glass vases, dozens of them, fill the apartment everywhere, and I can smell them from where I'm standing in the hall. Mrs. Wolf glances behind her to see what I'm staring at, then back to me. I'm looking for... Doesn't Paul Owen live here? A long pause before she answers. No, he doesn't. Another long pause. Are you, like, sure? I ask before feebly adding, I don't understand. She realizes something that causes the muscles in her face to tighten. Her eyes narrow but don't close. She's noticed the surgical mask I'm gripping in a damp fist and she breathes in sharply, refusing to look away. I am definitely not feeling right about any of this. On the TV, in a commercial, a man holds up a piece of toast and tells his wife, Hey, you're right, this margarine really does taste better than shit. The wife smiles. You saw the ad in the Times? She asks. No. I mean, yes. Yes, I did. In the Times. I falter, gathering a pocket of strength, the smell from the roses thick, masking something revolting. But doesn't Paul Owen still own this? I ask as forcibly as possible. There's a long pause before she admits, there was no ad in the Times. We stare at each other endlessly. I'm convinced she senses I'm about to say something, I've seen this look on someone's face before. Was it in a club? A victim's expression? Had it appeared on a movie screen recently? Or had I seen it in the mirror? It takes what seems like an hour before I can speak again. But that's his... I stop. My heart skips, resumes beating. Furniture. I drop my umbrella, then lean down quickly to retrieve it. I think you should go, she says. I think I want to know what happened. I feel sick, 
My chest and back covered with sweat, drenched, it seems, instantaneously. Don't make any trouble, she says. All frontiers, if there had ever been any, seem suddenly detachable and have been removed. A feeling that others are creating my fate will not leave me for the rest of the day. This is not a game, I want to shout, but I can't catch my breath, though I don't think she can tell. I turn my face away. I need rest. I don't know what to say. Confused, I reach out for a moment to touch Mrs. Wolf's arm to steady myself, but I stop it in mid-air, move it to my chest instead, but I can't feel it, not even when I loosen my tie. It rests there, trembling, and I can't make it stop. I'm blushing, speechless. I suggest you go, she says. We stand there in the hallway facing each other. Don't make any trouble, she says again, quietly. I stand there a few seconds longer before finally backing away, holding up my hands, a gesture of assurance. Don't come back. She says, I won't, I say, don't worry. The couple appears in the doorway. Mrs. Wolf watches me until I'm at the elevator door, pressing the button for the attendant. In the elevator, the smell of the roses is overpowering.